So critical theory in, uh, in theology, understanding an influential academic movement. Let me start um, by emphasizing that this is, not, this is not a talk on critical race theory, but a talk on the critical theory of the Frankfurt School and its impact on theology. Let me start uh, with uh, a personal introduction. You can see here a picture of the reburial of the prime minister of the 1956 revolution who was executed after the revolution. And um, uh, this was a symbolic event, very significant symbolizing the spiritual end of communism in Hungary. And uh, my father took me to this square. There were hundreds of thousands of people. And so maybe one of those faces or heads in the crowd is me and my father. And this was a defining moment in my life. I lived the first 17 years of my life in a Marxist country. At school, I studied everything from a Marxist perspective. And during the decades of the Marxist experiment, it was absolutely clear that to be a Christian meant that you could not be a Marxist and the other way around. When communism ended, I didn't think, I honestly didn't think I would ever again have a debate about Marxism because it collapsed. It proved to be wrong. It resulted in immense suffering and total bankruptcy everywhere. So in 1991, I went to Italy, Leonardo's beautiful country, and I met a young guy who claimed to be a communist. And it was shocking to me. And I, I thought, how could anyone be a communist anymore? especially in the winning West. Today, 30 years later, I see, hear, and smell Marxist ideas all over the West. Media, universities, political movements, uh, mainstream political movements. But what is even more shocking to me is, is that these ideas are present in the church. Has cultural Marxism successfully infiltrated the Western intellectual world? Wikipedia doesn't think so. Uh, they have a, an entire entry on uh, uh, saying that cultural Marx Marxism is a, I mean, speaking about cultural Marxism is a conspiracy theory, a right wing anti Semitic conspiracy theory. Um, but I would, I would um, argue differently, and we need to understand critical theory, in my opinion, in order to be able to answer this question, whether uh, cultural Marxism has infiltrated the Western intellectual world. So <clears throat> the first thing we need to know is that all the early ideologists of critical theory were avowed Marxists. They were critical of classical Marxism, but their thoughts can only be understood in relation to classical Marxism. So I would like to say some th things about classical Marxism. And in order to understand classical Marxism, we have to make one further step uh, to Hegel. Karl Marx, together with Ludwig Feuerbach, Friedrich Engels, and several others, belonged to the influential German group of the so-called Young Hegelians. This group followed the dialectical philosophy of Hegel. Hegel's intention was to show that philosophy and religion were reconcilable, and thus to refute rationalist critics of the Kantian type, while at the same time attacking the supernatural theologians who believed in a philosophically unprovable revelation. 
Marx's dialectical materialism retained Hegel's dialectical logic, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, but put it into a materialistic framework. Marx wanted to detach the dialectical way of thinking from a pure theoretical context and apply it to the socio-political context in which it can be validated. The antithesis for Marx became a social antithesis between the ruling class and the exploited classes, between the working class and the owners of the means of production. Marx turned away from Hegel's religious idealistic concept of development and laid the foundations of a materialistic dialectics that in a Democritian fashion, the Greek atomistic or materialistic philosopher, Democritian fashion takes only matter into account as foundational reality. And just like Feuerbach sees God as a projection of the human consciousness. In the German ideology, Marx together with Engels declared that declared his philosophical program in terms of a new materialistic starting point. Let me quote from uh, the German ideology. In direct contrast to a German philosophy, which descends from heaven to earth, here one descends from earth to heaven. In other words, to arrive at man in the flesh, one does not set out from what men say, imagine, or conceive, nor from man as he is described, thought about, imagined, or conceived. Rather, one sets out from real active man and their actual life process and demonstrates the development of the ideological reflexes and echoes of that process. Morality, religion, metaphysics, and all the rest of ideology and their corresponding forms of consciousness no longer seems to be independent. And now comes the most important sentence. Consciousness does not determine life, but life determines consciousness. This we learned at school. For Marx, history can be explained as a dialectical development that is constrained by materialistic causes, chief of which is the form of ownership, who owns the means of production. Changes in ownership and in a mode of production describe the phases of history, and class struggle moves to history towards its goal, communism. So here's a chart uh, of the Marxist uh, idea of history as a dialectical process. Um, first stage is primitive communism, uh, which is prehistoric man, where there were no classes and no uh, private property. So there was no oppression. And then slave owning uh, societies where uh, there was the conflict between slave owners and slaves, feudalism, landowners and serfs, capitalism, bourgeoisie, proletariat, socialism, state managers, workers, and communism, where again, uh, there are no classes, so there is no conflict anymore. That's the end goal of history through a dialectical process. In the communist manifesto, Marx and Engels declared that this last phase can only be entered into by the revolution of the proletariat. Quotation from the Communist Manifesto. The communists openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at the communistic revolution, the proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. The next idea that is absolutely crucial if we want to understand Marxism is the 
difference between the base and the superstructure. The base, uh, says Melvin Rader, the base in Marx's model is the mode of production. So the economic relations. And the superstructure is the political state with its laws and the culture with its science, philosophy, art, religion, morality, and customs. Because the superstructure rests on the base, so law, morality, religion, art, etc., rests on the base, economy, and not the other way around, the model implies that the base determines the superstructure. So life, real life, determines consciousness. And religion is a false consciousness of the oppressed, the well-known sentence from Marx, it is the opium of the people. Now, um, Antonio Gramsci is the next uh, person that we have to uh, deal with because Gramsci is a bridge between classical Marxism and the critical theory of the Frankfurt School. Uh, he was imprisoned by the fascists in 1926. He died in prison in 1937, but it was a very productive era for him because he wrote many of his works during this uh, prison time. Now, what did Gramsci say? Why is he important? Gramsci agreed with Lenin that the communist revolution will not happen as an economic necessity. So the base will not automatically produce the revolution. What prevents the revolution from happening in the West, because it only happened in Russia, and even that was sort of a coup. What is preventing it from happening in the West is the cultural hegemony dominating Western societies, family, law, art, education, Christianity. the economic base will not necessarily change the superstructure, said Gramsci. We need to start from the superstructure. So what was his strategy? A new counter hegemony should be created within the superstructure. So a new sort of consciousness should be created in society, a new counter hegemony. How a coalition has to be built from the oppressed, marginalized, disenfranchised groups of society. Gramsci said it will be a long march through the institutions. So the institutions of society must be captured in order to create this counter hegemony. And once the superstructure is changed, society will be ready for the communist revolution. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is Gramsci's uh, open uh, library of thought. Now, you can see a similar reversal in the relationship between the base and the superstructure in the Frankfurt School. And uh, beside Gramsci, Lukács Győrgy, Hungarian philosopher, is also a very strong uh, influence on the, on the Frankfurt School. Lukács tried to find a more dialectical relationship in the interaction of the base and the superstructure, still retaining the assumption that in the end the base prevails, which Rader calls organic totality, this uh, dynamic relationship between the base and the superstructure. Both Lukács and Gramsci focused their critique on the social forces that prevent people from understanding how power affects their lives. According to Lukács, the world objectifies us. It treats us as objects. And the way out is not another theoretical analysis, but revolutionary action. Um, he was one of the leaders of the 1919 
uh, bloody communist experiment, which is called the Red Terror in Hungary. Uh, later, Lukács also put the emphasis on culture, and uh, uh, he was uh, his thinking was influenced by the 1956 revolution, and th he said that action must shape the superstructure, and he wrote a lot on literature, art, and education. Thomas Mann uh, formed the character of Nafta in Zaubertberg, if you uh, happen to have read that uh, novel, after the character of Lukács Dürth. After 1956, most Lukács disciples in Hungary became postmodernists, just like Derrida and, and uh, several other French intellectuals. The theoretical foundations of the Frankfurt School, which Gramsci and Lukács influenced, was critical theory, which Horkheimer first called materialism, interestingly, but then critical theory became the the term that is used for their uh, school of thought. Now, um, the theorists of the Frankfurt School were Marxists, were avowed opponents of the capitalist system and wanted an egalitarian society where the oppressed and disenfranchised are liberated from perceived oppression. So, it was very clear from the beginning that they were Marxists and had a Marxist agenda. And uh, the reason this uh, school came about was the failure of the German revolution in 1921, which puzzled Marxist thinkers, uh, especially because they felt that they were getting farther and farther away from the potential of a revolution. The working class were uh, getting satisfied in where they were. And uh, so, it, there is no breakthrough in uh, Germany. And that was the time where they founded the Institute for Social Research in uh, 1923. The original aim of the Institute was to be a contribution to Marxism as a scientific discipline by re-examining its foundations and by preparing for future actions. And uh, at the beginning uh, phase, uh, they produced a lot of dry economic papers, which uh, were quite uninteresting. But uh, in 1930, Max Horkheimer became the new director of the Institute, and he gave a new aim to the Institute. And the aim was to critique and change a pathological society as a whole, because uh, he thought that the proletariat did not have a revolutionary potential yet. It's a pathological society and we should critique it and change it. The reason Horkheimer thought the Marxist revolution did not take place is the fact that the consciousness of the working class was dominated by the cultural hegemony of the bourgeoisie. The most important book of, the, of critical theory in the Frankfurt School was uh, Horkheimer's tradi Traditional and Critical Theory, which he published in 1937, and Jean-Philippe Durante called, uh, acts, it acts like a Bible of critical theory. So that is the, the, the most important uh, early writing of, of critical theory. And now we have to understand that critical theory is not simply critical thinking in the Kantian sense but a Marxist political agenda. This is, this is a very important uh, point that I want to make. In traditional theory, so uh, Horkheimer makes a distinction between traditional and critical theory. In traditional theory, laws and facts are described as though they are not strongly influenced by the social conditions in which these laws and facts are found. So it doesn't criticize the uh, source from which uh, these uh, laws and facts arise. Critical theory on the, other, on the other hand is dialectical in the Hegelian sense. It examines the contradictions in the social economical order to enhance change. The new aim is not simply to describe like traditional theory, but to prescribe and change. That's critical 
theory. Interestingly, the new theoreticians are not sociologists or economists like in the early stage, but philosophers, aestheticians, psychologists. Uh, reminding me of uh, Bill Clinton's uh, famous sentence about economy, it's the, it's the culture stupid. That's what they understood. The first generation of uh, critical theorists were Max Horkheimer, Theodor Adorno, Herbert Marcuse, Pater Benjamin, Eric Fromm. The second generation is usually identified by uh, Jürgen Habermas, who had a little different track. And the third generation is generally Habermas disciples like Honet or Alessandro Ferrara and others. When the Nazis came to power in Germany, members of the Frankfurt School fled to the United States and replaced uh, or relocated their uh, institute to the United States. And it's important because they were invited to uh, American universities, they taught, uh, they spread their ideas and they, they did it in English. So critical theory um, got the vessel of the English language, which made it uh, much, much more powerful uh, as, as the decades went by. And uh, I just men want to mention here that critical theory was later adapted to the racial conflicts on the, of the U United States and uh, through various stages, critical race theory arose. Now, what are the main assumptions behind critical theory? Um, one of the most important assumptions is that relationships are dominated by power. Relationships are dominated by power. And we hear it so many times that we often don't even think about how absurd it, this is, but it's one of the main assumptions of critical theory. Uh, Vody Bauckham, who wrote, a, uh, he speaks a lot and criticizes a lot uh, the influence of critical theory and critical race theory on uh, the evangelical movement and Christi Christianity and socially. Uh, Vody Bauckham says, Marx really saw at bottom the root of relationships between people as conflict over limited resources. That's at the bottom of relationships. He says, I mean, Marx says, according to uh, Bodhi Bakken. The other main assumption uh, behind critical theory is that the oppressive power that is present in relationships is systemic. Uh, the, the Western liberal world functions as a, a, as a cultural hegemony, which is totalizing everything and systemically oppresses us. Uh, Adorno said, through use and exchange, the masses are defined by the products they consume. They uh, heavily criticize the culture industry. Horkheimer hated uh, what he saw in the film industry and the music industry in uh, the United States. And uh, the critical theorists wrote a lot against cultural or cultural industry. And they emphasized that the individual should be free from the totalizing effects of the cultural industry. Uh, they saw this as a logical development of the enlightenment which we might think uh, was friendly or at least uh, a close cousin to their thinking, but they saw it, saw it as an enemy in many ways. Uh, Herbert Marcuse wrote One Dimensional Man, a very influential uh, book in the 60s. In, uh, in this book, Marcuse argues that while the system we live in may claim to be democratic, it is actually totalitarian. A form of technological rationality has imposed itself on every aspect of culture and public life and has become hegemonic. According to a critical theorist, Douglas Kanner, so he's in that, that school, 
he wrote the introduction to uh, One Dimensional Man in the uh, uh, recent uh, publication or uh, edition of that book. Um, according to Kellner, One Dimensional Man was one of the most important books of the 1960s and one of the most subversive books of the 20th century. In the introduction to Marcuse's book, he writes, lacking the power of authentic self-activity, one-dimensional man submits to increasingly total domination. Marcuse is thus a radical individualist who is deeply disturbed by the decline of the traits of authentic individuality that he so highly values. In the same introduction, he says, for the new left, one-dimensional man articulated what young radicals felt was wrong with society. And the book's dialectic of liberation and domination provided a framework for radical politics, which struggled against domination and for liberation. Moreover, one dimensional man showed that the problems confronting the emerging radical movement were not simply the Vietnam War, racism or inequality, but the system itself. And that solving a wide range of social problems required fundamental social restructuring. In this way, one dimensional man played an important role in the political education of a generation of radicals. And to this day has inspired those involved in the development of critical philosophy and social theory. No wonder Marcuse was one of the heroes of the 1968 uh, student revolt. And uh, at many places, students wrote three M's on uh, walls and different places, which refer to Marx, Mao, and Marcuse. In uh, the authoritarian personality, Adorno, another uh, one of the uh, Frankfurt School argued that authoritarianism is the result of harsh parenting. And authoritarianism is also rooted in suppressed homosexuality, which is redirected into outward hostility toward the father, which is in turn suppressed for fear of being infantilized and castrated by the father. Uh, William Young, social writer, uh, says the authoritarian personality changed academic attitudes towards the family within psychology and sociology. Herbert Marcuse argued that monogamous marriage enforced submission to social rules and the compulsion to work. Cultural Marxism and psychoanalysis converged on the theory that the patriarchal authoritarian family and its repressive morality served the interests of class society. Um, it's important that critical theory has a specific understanding of freedom and hierarchy. Freedom is autonomy. Hierarchy is oppression. I will come back to this uh, in a second. Critical theory's influence on the Western intellectual world was filtered through other intellectual movements. I just mentioned three, Freudianism, which emphasized that libido is the deepest motivation. So sexual, sexuality is very important. Existentialism, which emphasized that uh, our aim should be to be authentic, authenticos, self-authoring. So we should resist anyone else defining us. We should define ourselves. And post-structuralism and queer theory, a rejection of what Derrida called uh, phallogocentrism, and heter heteronormativity, so male uh, logic and heteronormativity, and that power is truth, not truth is power. So let me briefly uh, say some words about theology and how it comes to theology. Critical theorists often used religious, Christian, biblical references. Uh, just a few examples, uh, Alain Badiou, St. Paul, the foundation of universalism. Uh, Giorgio Agamben, the time that remains a commentary on the letter to the Romans. Antonio Negri, a labor of Job. Uh, 
Heller Ágnes, Im, hol vagyok el? Philosophical Understanding of the Book of Genesis. Slavoj Zizek often refers to Christian themes. Daniel Ben Said compares revolutionary commit commitment to Pascal's wager. Uh, Negri and Hart uh, compares uh, St. Francis of Assisi and his work to the communist uh, uh, militant idea of restructuring society. Um, theology and religious language was strategic in changing the consciousness of the people and the superstructure because the societies where they uh, spread their ideas were Christian societies. So the roots and aims of critical theoretical theologies are political. And this is very, very important. Uh, Rosario Forlenza said that Gramsci saw religion as an active mode of experiencing social and historical reality. Billing said religion promotes either social quiescence or opposition, no neutrality. And the new hegemony that uh, I think we can now say is present in the Western world and is becoming dominant is shaping theological thought. In the academia and the church, theologians themselves teach critical theoretical ideas. And let me finish by giving you some signs where I think critical theory is present in, um, in the theological world. Some examples, some signs, some clues. First, careless use of critical terminology like social justice, oppression, liberation. This is either deliberate or due to a lack of understanding of what these terms really mean, because these terms, terms are not whatever you mean by them. These are specific terms coming from critical theory. For example, social justice today means equity, economic equality of outcome, dismantling of traditional structures, including the Christian family, moral superiority of the perceived oppressed groups, intersectionality, and you can include some other thoughts in this system. So when we use social justice, the word, and we use it carelessly without giving it a very clear opposite de definition, by default, what is meant by that is what I just said. Another sign is relationships reduced to power struggles instead of negotiations, cooperations, love, willing obedience. The Bible does talk about abuse of power, but relationships are not reduced to power struggles. Even leadership is essentially responsibility, divinely given authority. It is sin that causes its abuse, not the existence of power. Another, another sign is as when we notice a shift of emphasis from sin to system. The problem here is with the tendency and the proportions. So I'm not saying that there are no systemic problems, that there are never systemic problems. But when we notice that there is a clear shift from talking about system and not about sin, when we move the problem outside us and the solution as well, then we are probably influenced by critical theory. In the Bible, the main problem is always the heart. Jesus did not liberate the Jews from the Romans, from under the Romans, but from the tyranny of sin and death. And another one is when issues of the world are thematizing the message of the church, racism, patriarchy, equality, diversity, LGBTQ issues, and so on. I honestly found it troubling that as the BLM movement was raging last year, churches and Christian organizations also began to preach against racism. I think of all times that was the least credible and the least prophetic to do. It just showed the church was following the, the themes of the world. Even though I, I believe racism can be a serious sin in the church. But it's just the timing was, was clearly uh, not prophetic for us. And lastly, an unbiblical understanding of freedom and hierarchy. When you notice that freedom is used as autonomy or an authentic self, then you know that it's not biblical freedom that we are talking about. Biblical freedom is desiring what God wants. 
being free from the effect of rebellion and sin. Or when you see that hierarchy is always talked about as oppression, you can sense critical theory, theory, smart critical theory, because in the Bible, hierarchy is leadership and obedience in love. And lastly, I just want to uh, mention very briefly that let's not forget that the universe is a kingdom. It's, it's not a democracy. And we don't pray, uh, may the egalitarian universe come, but we pray thy kingdom come, Lord, and we bow our knees. So let me finish with this uh, from Timothy, this quotation from 2 Timothy 3. Paul, the apostle, as he's getting old, warns us, but understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with deceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. Thank you for your attention and 